Zu seinen Kunden gehören Unternehmen wie Regierungen und auch Bildungsinstitute. Wir freuen uns sehr, dass er heute hier beim ÖHV-Kongress ist. Powered bei der Renko, Hermann Konings. Herzlichen Applaus bitte. I'm breaking everything down. Uh, should I use this one? Yeah. Okay. Ich spreche nicht äh, so viel Deutsch. Ich verstehe es ein bisschen. Ich habe es schon gesagt, ich bin von Antwerpen. Antwerp is the second most beautiful town in the world. <laughs> the mayor is... <laughs> you didn't hear that. Um, und uh, das ist in Flandern. Oh, Flandern, Flanders. Und uh, wir, wir sprechen uh, Niederländisch, Flämisch und uh, es ist ein bisschen Deutsch. Und ich habe, wie ich eine sehr junge Junge war, habe ich das deutsche Fernsehen gesehen. Wie Sendungen, uh, like, I, I, I told them that the second most beautiful town in the world is Antwerp. The mayor is still there. So, you, absolutely. So you can leave now. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> I had a chat with him. We are friends already. Um, but, uh, und die, Sendung, die Sendungen, wie die Sendung mit der Maus, und das feuerrote Spielmobil in den Jahren 70 und der Alte und Derek und Rudi Carell am laufenden Band. But that's all I can uh, tell you about. I, I, I can understand the German language, but unfortunately I can't speak it for a fluent keynote like the one this morning. I'm going to talk about the future. I'm not a fortune teller. I'm not looking into crystal balls. I do look into crystal balls, but only on a Friday evening when there is some gin and tonic inside. <laughs> but I'm not trying to understand the future uh, regarding, uh, uh, regarding the things that will happen. I'm not saying that things will happen, but that things may happen. I try to understand the future by looking into reports. We are working in Antwerp with scientists and the scientists we love. I'm, I'm a psychologist by education. You don't have to be afraid. I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm not into the deviant minds of people. I'm trying to understand the changing minds of people. Why are we doing today totally different things compared to yesterday? And why will we change our behavior or attitudes or value systems tomorrow? We are changing, believe me, you know that. Look into your photos of, let's say, five or ten years ago, and you will be absolutely ashamed of yourself. What was I thinking that day? How do I look? And that hairdress. But at that time, it was normal. Today, it has changed. So we are changing, and we will change also in the future. This is not your or my teenager daughter's bedroom. This is Europe. This is Europe. So this is here, Villach. And this is where I live and work, Antwerp, in a light blue underwear. Belgium is light blue underwear. Huh? And uh, this is Antwerp. This is my uh, house. And uh, <laughs> it isn't. Fortunately, it isn't. It's a beautiful building. It's one of the landmarks of Antwerp. It's the mayor is gone. It's the most beautiful city in the world. And uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the, the harbor house uh, built by Zaha Hadid in Antwerp. And Antwerp is a beautiful city. And in Antwerp, we try to understand the future of things and people. I'm absolutely a fan of scientists. We are listening to scientists like psychologists, sociologists, ecologists, biologists, anthropologists, generational experts, but physicians, physicists, uh, engineers, um, historians even, philosophers, uh, uh, people who are trying to understand or to create the future, scientists, are very important to us. So we are giving some guesstimates to our kunden, to our clients. And a guesstimate is a guess and an estimate at the same time. A guess is intuition. It's your gut feeling. You guess something because your experience. You are guessing the future of hospitality and travel and, and tourism because you're experienced in that matter. But it's not enough. You have also to validate your guesses. And validation of guessing is estimating. If you guess and estimate at the same time, you're guesstimating. The, the keynote speech title is We 
myself and AI. It's not about me, myself and I, but we, myself and AI. It's about we, the social psychology or social intelligence, myself, the personal or emotional intelligence or psychology, and AI, the artificial intelligence. It's not the future won't be digital, with all respect, it won't be digital, but digital. I'm going to talk to you about the digital future. It's a combination of the digital and the physical. Let's start with another Flemish painter. And I was, well, I arrived yesterday evening in, in, uh, in Salzburg. And maybe I had to go to Vienna because yesterday, well, this morning at two o'clock this morning, the beautiful exhibition of my Antwerp forefather, Peter Bruegel, the Elter, the, the Elder, the, the Alter, the, the, the Alter, the Commissar, the Alter, <laughs> um, Peter Bruegel, who lived in Flanders around Antwerp in the 16th century, painted this beautiful painting. And normally it hangs in Antwerp, and I think it will coming back with me this afternoon back to Antwerp, where it belongs. Now it is in, well, it was until yesterday or this morning, this, I've, I've heard that uh, the people were waiting until two o'clock this morning to see the exhibition at the Kunsthistorisches Museum. Peter Bergel the Elder, and he painted, and this painting was there. This is the, uh, the renewed uh, version of Mad Margaret, Mad Mag, de Dulle Griet in, in Dutch. Uh, Marguerite à la folle en français. Mad Margaret, the, the mad lady here. And it's interesting, it was painted by Peter Bruegel in 1563, and this painting is for me a visionary painting. It's explaining 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. But seen by a visionary artist, Peter Bruegel, the old one in the 16th century, 1563. And on this painting, you'll see your clients, your consumers, the consumer of today and tomorrow. It's on this painting. It's not Ma Margaret herself, although she is like a consumer with a lot of stuff she bought. She's fleeting away from the Black Friday meeting <laughs> of consumers slaughtering each other to have the best sales. And she's with, she has a good kind of stuff already bought and she tries to beaten up the demons inside the mouth of the hell. It's not about her. It's about this little creature. This is the client, consumer, citizen, your midglieder, your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, your children, yourself today and tomorrow. It's called a head footer, head with feet and arms. Head footers were um, in most of the time to be seen in allegoric paintings of the 16th century. Also, in the early 16th century, Jeroen Bosch, you know, 50 years earlier than uh, Peter Bruegel, uh, also painted a lot of head footers. Now, this is not a traditional head footer. And the first thing we see here, and this is so typical today, there is a spoon inside his mouth slash behind. There is a, a spoon inside the mouth slash behind. And we've asked the academic department of the Museum Meyer van den Berg in Antwerp, where the painting normally hangs, as from the end of this week, it will be back where it belongs, in Antwerp. And we've asked the academic department, what does it mean there is a spoon inside the mouth slash anus? It's more beautiful in French. You know, we Belgians, we have also a French parting speaking part. And uh, the French... Well, they, oui, uh, quand je donne une présentation en français, je parle de « il y a une cuillère dans la derrière ». There is a spoon inside his mouth, slash, behind. Il y a une cuillère dans la derrière. But anyway, it's like carnival. Uh, there is a spoon. What does it mean? And they said, well, it means there is no time to digest. If you put something of food inside your mouth and it immediately comes out, there is no time to digest. So there was no time in the 16th century. People were working, 95% of people were working very hard. There was no weekend, there was no uh, retirement, there was no, no, no free 
vacation. There was no travel, vacation, or tourism in those days. People were working very hard. There was no time to digest for 95%. 5% of the, the, the clergy and, and the, the knights and the princes and the dukes, well, they had all the time of the world. But most of the people had no time. And the thing is today, when we go back to Western Europe, Austria, Belgium, whatever, you see the same. We have seen studies from the European Commission that the average loss per week of free spendable time, very important for your industry, free spendable time, not looking into, of course, travel tourism or business tourism or business hospitality, but if you look at the time we've lost the last 25 years, we means people like you and I working between 20 years of age and 60 years of age. Very good news, of course, also for the next couple of years for you is that a lot of baby boomers will retire the next couple of, of years. A lot of people having a lot of money going into tourism. Good news for you. But people like you and I working between, let's say, 20 and 60 years of age, we've lost seven hours per week compared to 25 years ago. Do you follow? 1994, compared to 2019, well, in 1994, the average Western European worker, professional, in all kinds of sectors, blue collars and white collar workers, at average had seven hours per week more free spendable time compared to today. How is that possible? The loss of free spendable time. It's more than leisure time only. It's also the time you have to go with your children to a doctor or to, to a run shop or doing things in your free spendable time. How did we lose that time, seven hours a week, which means on a yearly base, two full weeks of full 24-hour days, lost, not likely to spend it for free time, leisure time, free spendable time. Where did it, where did it go wrong? Well it, go, well, it went wrong 25 years ago. 60% of the Western European workers were working with a blue or gray color, doing simple jobs, nine to five jobs. Not like you, working five to nine in a way. White collar people, pink collar people, people working with their brains in the knowledge and service economy. You are working the knowledge and service economy. And if you're working knowledge and service economy, you lose time. Traffic jams, traffic jams compared to 25 years ago, well, to compare to 12 years ago, the number of hours lost in traffic has doubled throughout Western Europe, also in Austria. Working in the knowledge and service economy means that you are working also outside the traditional hours, working on your laptop, also on your vacation, your proper vacation, you're working, you're responding emails. You're responding emails and you're working, not having a, a, a tourist feel or, or, or having free time to be spent. Uh, we have traffic jams, of course, we have to go to network events, we have our meetings with the Americans on Skype or FaceTime always in the late afternoon. You're going earlier out of your bed to get later into your bed. We have seen the studies of seven hours loss per week. And therefore, there is a spoon inside your and my mouth slash anus. There is no time to digest. Let's see. There is no, well, it should work with sound. Interesting, we have used this clip with sound, but there's no sound anymore. There was a general repetition, so it should work. Three, two, one, this is digital times. No. And it's HDMI? HDMI. So I'm waiting for the. How are your children? Good. <laughs> A lot of sweat over there. We have checked the, the sound earlier, so it should work. Okay. Now it's exploding. Uh, 
said. Let's have a look inside the computer. Okay. You spent. Okay, you can clap and I start again. <laughs> okay, there we go. This commercial is just one minute out of the 10 hours a day you spent glued to your screens. That's 152 days a year. That's 32 years of your life scrolling stuff, clicking stuff, emojiing stuff, watching other people's pictures of their cafe macchiato or their dog or their baby or their dog and baby or the view out of their airplane window or a rainbow, watching vloggers take something out of a box, watching reality shows, watching shows about housewives, watching shows about housewives in a different state, watching dragons, watching a year's worth of one show about a Colombian businessman in one evening, watching someone else playing a video game, watching cats being cats, swiping left, 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 shake. Right, left, right. Deciding if a picture is a labradoodle or fried chicken. Deciding if a picture is a chihuahua or a muffin or a puppy or a bagel. Reading comments from someone you barely know. Posting about something you don't care about. Telling 647 people what's on your mind. Reading what's on the mind of 647 people. Reading a tremendous amount of opinions about politics. Yeah. We're working for Nike and even Nike is saying, well, it's now becoming a problem to have people running or jogging. The last 10 years, it was a wonderful alternative for group sports. People were running and jogging more and more. So Nike were selling more and more sneakers. Now they see the last couple of years that even jogging or running is too hard for people if they arrive at home at 7 or 7.30 or 8. They are tired and there is no time left for running even. People want to have a conversation to talk to their wives and play with their children. Or play with their wives and talk to their children, which is also an option. <laughs> so there is no time. There is a spoon inside the mouth slash anus. But there is something else on this beautiful picture of this head footer. There is a beautiful balance. If you ask me, there is a perfect juxtaposition. On the one hand, the head footer, the consumer, you and I of today, holds a food truck related bowl with gluten-free muesli or kruesli <laughs> in lactose-free almond milk. Slow food, yeah? <laughs> Slow food, 1563. Very artisanal, crafted, vintage. Crafted is a beautiful word. Artisan. On the, this side, you have absolutely the trend of the physical, the analog. And on the other side, perfectly in juxtaposition, we'll see, we see Zalando. <laughs> which is a digital. And this is interesting. This is what we call a fidgetal head footer. Because a fidgetal is the contraction, is the, is the fusion of the physical and the digital at the same time. The future is not physical or digital. The future will be digital. And you can say, oh yeah, the baby boomers, 50 and 60-somethings, they are likely to retire and go back into memory lane. They will be absolutely into the physical again. They are buying this kind of things. You know, this is for the eighth year in a row in Europe, a trend. Vinyl records, turning tables, audio cassettes, with or without pencils, are in. Media Markt is selling more than ever, ugh, compared to 25 years ago, vinyl records and turning tables. To the baby boom generation? No. We baby boomers, 50 and 60 somethings, are absolutely likely to understand Spotify or Deezer these days. But this is a typical thing, trend for the youngster generation, for the millennial generation. Most of the vinyl records, audio cassettes, are bought by young people younger than 35 years of age, who are buying Moleskin notebooks, young people younger than 35, who are driving these food trucks, people younger than 35, who is a barista in a coffee bar these days, young people younger than 35, who are crafting wine, crafting gin, crafting beer, People younger than 35, who have these beehives on top of their dwellings, people younger than 35, who are into a, um, a vegetable garden in their own uh, houses, 
even in the apartments, who are into vegan stuff. Young people younger than 35, who are buying the so-called drawing books for adults. You know the drawing books for adults? Who are buying these drawing books? Well, the 50-somethings and the 60-somethings are, because we try to understand if we can still manage to draw without stressing the lines. So, but most of the, most, a lot of the, this is, I've, I've, I have a beautiful example of, I found something very, the stabilo marker, you know a marker? This is a trend in Europe. Stabilo told me last month, this is a huge success among young people. Young people are buying these markers. In digital words, aren't they digital people? Yes, they are. They love the digital, but they love also to escape the digital from time to time. And this is interesting for your industry also. Look at Amazon. Amazon understands the digital. Amazon started two years ago in the United States opening physical bookstores. They started 25 years ago, well, to, to make vanish the physical bookstores because they had a new business model, the digital bookstore. And now they are opening physical bookstores, Morton Bricks foot, um, um, uh, bookstores. And if you enter an Amazon bookstore in the United States on A locations, the, in the largest cities in the United States, you see a, a paper and a pen where the program of that day is written on the paper, and you see here a chalkboard with references in choke to Amazon.com. And in the bookstores, you have digital touch point also. If you enter the bookstore, you have an app of Amazon, and you'll find your book title immediately. There is this kind of microways inside. You follow the trace or the trail to the book you love to hold in your hands. Interesting, the digital is becoming an interesting evolution. And also in the retail industry. We're working for the retail. I was four years ago, in 2015, interesting, four years ago, IBM, still one of the largest B2B technology firms in the world, was stating this in five years. So in 2020, buying local will beat online. Local means the physical. Buying local will beat online. Interesting. What is IBM saying? IBM is saying, well, we will see more and more digital touch points in the supermarkets, in the stores, in the whatever, whatever. So people won't lose time anymore. And this is, of course, interesting. We are buying online because we don't want to lose time. 71% of consumers is willing to skip a physical store for online shopping to avoid queues and other in-store hassles. This was the reason, the main reason to avoid a physical store because we lose time in queues. Well, Amazon opened the first queueless supermarket, digital supermarket in February 2018 the so-called Amazon Go store. You enter the store, put things from the shelf into your bag and get out. You don't have to pass the cashier anymore. Everything will be sensed, observed by, by cameras and, and calculated by algorithms, and you don't have to pass the cashier. There is no queue. It's the first so-called queueless supermarket. I have a picture for you of the first day of the opening of the Amazon Go <laughs> Cula supermarket. No lines, it says here, just walk in and out. Well, this was the first day, but there is absolutely also the belonging of people, the, 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 the longing, uh, not the belonging, the longing of people of coming into a store, a physical store, to have also personal contact. Personal contact is very important. In 2020, over 85% of sales will still be made offline, but nearly all will be influenced by the digital. Google already in 2016. The percentage of American consumers shopping at bricks and mortar stores weekly increased from 36% in 2014 up to 44% in 2018. In the Walhalla of the digital, stores. People are more and more going to a physical store. 
at least once a week. And not only in the United States, also here in Europe. And this is Belgium. The VVR is the Flemish board of uh, tour operators in Flanders. In 2017 was the first year since 2002 to see more Belgians visiting and booking at physical travel shops for the first time in 15 years. I have to be honest with you, what also works for the physical travel shops are two things. You know that. One, over-tourism. You're going to talk about over-tourism tomorrow. So over-bookings are there, and it's better to have a assurance with a travel agent instead of booking yourself. And secondly, the baby boom invasion. A lot of baby boomers are now entering the free time market. A lot of baby boomers do have 45 hours extra free spendable time, not working anymore and having 2.5 times more money to spend, and they will spend. Talking to you a little bit further on. But this is interesting. This is the demography of Western Europe. A lot of people here in the middle, the baby boom generation. There is a denatalization since 1965, less and less babies born. What is there the trigger? A Belgian doctor, Dr. Peters from Antwerp, who invented the contraceptive pill. So in Western Europe, you see a lot of less and less babies born. The baby boom directly after the Second World War, the war was over and there was a party going on. 20% more people born. 20 years long until 1964, my birth year, 1964. As from 1965, you see a decline of the number of births. Who is here born between 1945 and 1964? Let's see it. You are baby boomers. Sex, drugs and rock and roll. Well, sex, prescription, drugs, and rock and roll, in a way, if you're older than 55 this year. These people, the last 10 years, the half of them, or even more, are already retired. The next half will retire within the next 10 years, and then the baby boom is out. Now the decision makers are boomers, people who have the first um, generation after the Second World War, who have an other attitude, value system, than the next generation who will take over within this and 10 years. We see now a generation of competitive people. The boomers are competitive. We were taught, we were, we have, people have learned after the Second World War with the Marshall Plan coming over from the United States to become Competitive. I have a talent and you have a talent, so I'm going to beat your talent because I want to be better than you. The next generation is not competitive, but more collaborative. I have a talent, you have a talent, so let's join the talents to get quicker on the next stage. It's nothing to do with communism or, 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 or uh, solidarity. It's everything to do with the collaborative sharing economy. Typical for the next generation. These are the most important people <laughs> for your industry. In terms of numbers, a lot of people with a lot of time coming to them, a lot of money also, 2.5 times more money to spend. This is a spending generation. This generation, the boomers, the master boomers are the already retired people, the baby bloomers are the people to become retired. We go to up to 45 more or less, and up to 75 on the upper side. The master boomers and the baby bloomers, the boomer generation, 40% of the population having 80% of the spendable income, and they will spend. The pre-war generation is not likely to spend money. The pre-war generation is a silent generation. This is a very smart generation. They say, we know what it is, having nothing. We know about the war, about nature disasters, about economic depressions, about uh, terror. We've been there, about pandemonics even. And we are holding the money and not spending it. You know that your parents or grandparents are very economic, but the baby boom, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll generation, they have no experience. They have no experience in war of, or nature disasters or economic depressions. We were working very hard, and our wives or husbands also worked very hard. We have now 2.5 times more money to spend compared to our parents at average, and we will spend. The baby boomers here are also known as the Generation Ski. Interesting for Canton or the Austria. 
But ski doesn't mean skiing only. A lot of baby boomers now are on the, on the ski lane, you know that. But ski means, it's an acronym. It's spending their kids' inheritance. If you spend your kids' inheritance, you're a baby boomer. You are saying, now I'm about to live my life. We've worked very hard working for our children, and now we will spend. Spending their, who is younger than 45 in this room? You are the children of, <laughs> my condolences to you. Your parents are baby boomers spending your inheritance. And my advice to you, go this evening or tomorrow evening to your parents and try to financially strip them down tomorrow because within 20 years there will be nothing left for you to spend. <laughs> On the other side, this is good news for your industry. Baby boomers are likely to spend. I'm going to give you an, a beautiful hospitality example of the baby boom behavior. The baby boom behavior. This is a Libertin Lindenberg Hotel in Frankfurt. With all respect, but Frankfurt is not Berlin or Villa. <laughs> you know? But this is a very, very, very hot hotel. It's a baby boom hotel, the 70s. You, this is the lounge of the hotel. You see the baby boomers love this hotel. The average price per night is 350 euro. And baby boomers spend it. They love it. And you can say oh, 350 euro is a lot of money, but still it's a five-star hotel. But is it a five-star hotel? Never trust these fucking hotel classifications, it says. <laughs> and, but this is real. And baby boomers love it. They say, wow. They take pictures, selfies of them with, with their wife or husband and send it to their children. Look where we will stay for four nights and 1,400 euro at least. <laughs> They love to spend it. This is what we call neo-nonsense. It's not no-nonsense. The, the pre-war generation, the silent generation is no, no You take pictures, it's perfect, but I will also give the presentation in PDF to the organization so you can get the presentation also. Better quality than taking pictures. But if you take pictures of me, of course, be. <laughs> It's neo nonsense. So believe me, the next couple of years, take also into account a new kind of older between bracket people, the neo nonsense people. You know what psychologists are saying about the baby boomers? Baby boomers are people who want to die young, but as late as possible. <laughs> And But it's true. And then you, oh, then you have the digital aboriginals. You may say, these are the digital uh, aboriginals, the digital natives. The millennials are the digital natives, but they aren't the digital natives. They are the digital natives or the connected natives, the truly first connected generation. We psychologists are saying about the young, youngest generation, the digital aboriginals, that they are able first to swipe before they can grab. If you are able first to swipe before you can grab, then you are a digital Aboriginal. Let's have a look. Etc. Etc. Yeah. Yeah. And then we have the. <laughs> yeah. It does ring a bell, isn't it? And then we have the prime busters. This is the more prob most problematic generation. If you are between 30 and 45 years of age, then you are the first bust. You, bust means implosion of the number of births. After the boom, you get the bust. The first bust generation, also known as the generation X is absolutely in sorrow. There is no time for them, working more and more into the knowledge and service economy. 
there is no money for them. They are earning more money, but they have to spend more money because if they want to buy a house, also in Austria, you pay double the price of the house compared to 15 years ago. Because baby boomers at large are buying also houses. So the prices are up. It's a demographic evolution. So no time, no money, and no space, because the houses, well, they have children and they seek also more space. So they are going now outside of the cities, going back into the province, into the rural or pre-urban areas. This is a problematic generation in a way. And this is a beautiful example of how you can also, one of the things, having no, no money for the generation of the prime busters, is that the most of the, the, the generation with the most in percentage, so proportionally, the most divorced people are the ones between 30 and 45. The highest percentage of divorced people you find here. And it means also absolutely a problem in terms of finances, of course. And this is an interesting solution for them, the prime busters, is Le Colline Incantate in Italy. It's a hotel for divorced people to go together with their children on different levels. Father upstairs and mother downstairs, or vice versa. And this is no joke. It's absolutely meant for divorced people. So they, the children can see pa and ma every other day. And the father and mother don't have to meet each other because there is a distinction in the hotel. The prime busters. And then, of course, the millennials, a very important generation. It's also the first we generation. And we, myself, and AI is all also about the generation of the millennials. We means sharing. The baby boom generation is a me generation, like I told you earlier. Competition. Me, myself, and I. We are the metopia generation. But the children of the baby boomers are not longer a metopia, but a weetopia generation. Talents to be joined, to be um, uh, configured. Together we are stronger. I have my talents and you have your talents. Perfectly supplementary or complementary, so let's join the talents to get quicker on the next stage. It's more economic, it's more ecological, it's more smart than to have the idea of doing things separately. And you see also that sharing becomes the new normal. The more we share, the more we have. And you know that. Look at Airbnb, etc., etc. But look also, in, we are working on a long-term project for Europe, the European Commission, on the future of mobility. We are entering the worldwide we, instead of the worldwide web. We becomes more and more interesting. And I thought a few years ago, Car sharing won't work, but it is working already, thanks to the millennial generation. The number of car sharing clients in the European Union in 2011 was 700,000. This number is estimated to be 15 million in 2020. It is now around 11 million car sharing, commercial car sharing platforms. Blah, blah car in France. Car to go in, in Germany and the rest of Europe by BMW. It's working. Youngsters, 85% of car sharers are younger than 35 years of age. In car, having a car. In 2000, uh, according to the Institute for Demoscopie in Germany, in 2000, 44% of the men between 18 and 29 was interested in cars. In 2016, this percentage dropped to 31%. What about in 1983, 46.2% of the 16 years old, you know, 16 years, you're able to drive a car in the United States. Had a driver's license. In 2014, it was not more than 24.5%. People aren't that keen anymore for having a car or a car as such. We work. Another example of cooperation. And believe me, 85% of the we workers are younger than 35 years of age. This is a beautiful example in Paris, Station F startup campus. Thousand startups in Station F in Paris. 90% is younger than 35 years of age. Look at the hotel industry. Student hotels. It started a few years ago in Amsterdam. Now you have 15 student hotels. 80% of the rooms are commercial. 20% are filled by students. But 
the students have to work two or three hours a day in that hotel. Quid pro quo. You get something, but you have also to give something, namely working in the hotel. And then you can get your student room in our hotel. It's all about the, this is me with my colleague, who made a student and you never die. Typical baby boom reaction. Quid pro quo. Myself. It's all about emotional and personal intelligence. Scientific progress and technological changes have given the consumer or the user the tools to shape the world or their world in an intuitive way. It's not about one size fits all anymore. You know that also in your industry, it's about one size fits none. One size doesn't work. Pinpoint individually is possible thanks to scientific and digital progression. Beautiful example out from the, um, the food industry. With a lot of people having food allergies and food uh, intolerance, you also have now the possibility for a few bucks, like they say in the United States, for $60, 50 euro, you can get, for instance, this kind of habit DNA toolkit, where you can give a little bit of blood out of your pink or your finger and a little bit of saliva from the the, the cheek, inside your cheek, you can get a little bit of saliva and you send it to Habitat DNA. And a week later, you get perfect profile. You get your genome, your DNA passport, together with instructions what to eat or not to eat in terms of having no allergies or intolerance reactions on food. And it's also in Europe already possible. This is Thriva in the United Kingdom, together with Vita Mojo. Vita Mojo is a so-called uh, fast good food chain in the United Kingdom. If you send some of your blood and a sample of your saliva, you get perfectly what is good for you and, and for, your, for your tummy and for your, what you eat. And also Vita Mojo can get your card with your genome, with your DNA passport, and they make the salads and all the stuff you have to eat knowing what kind of eater you are in terms of DNA. It's pinpointed. And it's also in terms of digital technology. Pinpointing is becoming important. This is a beautiful example for the retail industry, for the online retail industry. One of the problems is that stuff you buy doesn't fit and you have to send it back. This is a beautiful example from Japan, now coming this year to Europe. It's called the Dozo suit, and it's a beautiful example of what we call intuitive, sorry, intuitive technology. But let's have a look to the clip. Your smartphone is ready. Begin measurement. Keep going. You are almost done. Measurements complete. This is named intuitive technology. Intuitive technology is all about artificial intelligence. Intuitive technology is technology you don't have to understand. You only have to use it. Intuitive technology has also to be part of your industry. It has to be 0123 proof. It has to follow the 0123 rules. What is 0123? O means no manual. You don't give manuals when people want to use technology. One means one button to start, on and off. Two means two key functions or options, instead of 150. Well, people, you like you and I, we want 150 options, but not at the same time. Start with two. Start creating architecture of choice. Left or right? Right. Okay. Upstairs or downstairs? Downstairs. So make your own architecture of choice. And three means three seconds to have a problem solved. Oh, one, two, three. This is intuitive technology like the Zozo suit. I have five minutes left, including the problems with technology. And I don't need more than that to get to the end. Artificial intelligence, algorithm is a dancer. I give you 
An example of choreography of digital codes, algorithms, are numeric digital codes to get out of the sea of data a relevant solution. This is all about algorithms. I'm going to give you a perfect, beautiful example of algorithms needed in the future. This is a tomato sorter. It sorts the green tomatoes from the red tomatoes. What you're going to see is the real time, well, the, 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 the right time of, uh, of the flow of how this robot works. First instance, this is the right time, and the robot is, exp like, now it's slowing. You see only the green tomatoes getting out, and this is the real time, you know? So this, is work, this works perfect, and robots are working perfect on that. And this is, of course, the Atlas Boston Dynamics. This is a robot doing very, very difficult things for a robot, thanks to algorithms and even the flop. Whoa. Yep. And victory. So this works perfectly. And then you have this in the hospitality industry. Alexis at Kimpton, IHG, the International Holiday Inn Group, is also working in uh, China on, on uh, voice-enabled intelligent concierges. And I personally think this is interesting. I'm not a fan of a robot in a hotel. I hate Pepper, you know, small white, I hate him. But when I want to order something, in, I was in, um, in Mexico a few months ago, and I, no, sorry, in Portugal a few months ago, and I tried to order something, room service, and I took the phone, and this lady, wonderful lady, didn't understand what I wanted, and they brought me something else. But if I can use this device that understands my language, it's a voice-enabled concierge, and I can talk to the, the concierge here, and it sends the information in the right language to the one in the kitchen working on my food, then can it be a perfect way of hospitality. But hospitality is not about technology. It's about, or artificial intelligence, it's about interwoven intelligence. And interwoven intelligence is the holy trinity of social, emotional, and artificial intelligence. It works when you combine them. Two examples, one from the hospitality industry, one, one from the, the health industry. This is Norway and Sweden. In Norway and Sweden, you have Kru. Kru in Sweden, Kru in Norway has 200 doctors working for you. If you want to have a doctor, your doctor, you have to wait and go to the doctor's room and wait there and, and you can get to the phone and ask your medical question. You can also go to Google, Dr. Google, but it doesn't work. You get a little bit upset after Dr. Google. But when you have a perfect combination of a person with social and emotional skills, face to face, but by means of technology, like this FaceTime, working perfectly uh, uh, artificially technological intelligent, you have a, com a, a, a confrontation, you have a contact with a person in flesh and blood, and you can ask him or her what your problem is. 24 four hours a day, seven hours a week, 365 days a year. You pay only 50 euro a year, having all time the possibility to have a contact with a real doctor in the flesh. And the thing, artificial thing here is, that the doctor knows, well, the system, not the doctor, the system knows who you are. If you are an introverted person, you get an introverted doctor. If you are an extroverted person, you get an extrovert. If you want a female doctor, you get a female doctor. Younger doctor, you get a younger doctor. It works perfectly on artificial intelligence. We, myself, and AI. The last example to quit my presentation also is that in the industry, in your industry, this is Public Hotels by Ian Schrager. And Ayn Schrager is saying, well, why should we have room service inside our own hotel? If you are in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, New York here or in London, you have 10,000 beautiful restaurants. And if you want to have a restaurant like a McDonald's or even a two-star Michelin restaurant, and it delivers you by means of Uber Eats or Deliveroo, let's work that way. Ein Schrager Public Hotels is giving you the possibility on your smartphone to order room service by ordering 
everything from the city. It will be delivered by a, a, a typical guy or girl, very introverted. The stuff will be bought, uh, bought for you. It will be delivered to the typical concierge who is making everything he gets or she gets on a beautiful plater with silver stuff, you know, silver plates and, and, and knives and forks. And it will be delivered to you by a friendly person knocking on your door. But the stuff you've ordered comes from Deliveroo or Uber Eats. This is also interwoven intelligence or streamlined service. Beautiful hotel, by the way. But this is not the way I think it should be. The Yotel in Miami, they are thinking not in terms of digital or interwoven, but in terms of the digital. This doesn't work. You can order your stuff by using Yoshi or Yolanda. If you ask for Yolanda and you get this in front of your room door, you are not happy. This is not about empathy because to end up the most important things, the most important thing that is in your industry, hospitality is empathy. Hospitality is about a very human trait of empathy. And that empathy can absolutely be joined by technology and digital systems and algorithms if it suits the client. But only working with robots doesn't work in your industry and it will never work, believe me. And not only for 50 and 60 and 70 and 80 plus people, but also for the younger digital generation. I'm at the end of my presentation. Within time, I believe, we have three minutes left. Beautiful expression to end up is how different are modern times. There are a lot of differences, but also a lot of similarities, if you ask me, on this timeline of 3,000 years. I thank you for your attention and give you a beautiful sight and my best congratulations for 2020, you know, because I'm into the future. I thank you for your attention. Hermann Konig, thank you for an amazing presentation. We were thrilled. Gibt es von Ihrer Seite aus noch Fragen oder sind Sie jetzt eh so überwältigt, dass Sie ein bisschen brauchen? Wir, wir treffen Sie sicher noch. You will stay with us. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to give a, a, short, a short break uh, out session. But now, if you have, we have three minutes before 11 and uh, two minutes. If you have questions, I'm still free of charge now. <laughs> Gut, wenn es jetzt direkt keine Fragen gibt, dann sage ich noch einmal herzliches or, uh, Dankeschön. If they don't have questions, or you didn't understand you anything, or you didn't understand everything. Uh, the, <laughs> you don't have questions? Okay. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. It was great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you.